This is the seventh video in a series on single agent search. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at variants of IDA star. We're gonna look at two variants here that share some close similarities. And we're gonna look at two of them called, um, so we have IDA star um, in, in these variants. The first one is gonna be parallel. How do we run IDA star in parallel? And the second one is going to be A star plus IDA star. And these algorithms, uh, as I said, in many ways are running very similar to each other. And in fact, we can build them off of each other. And so let's actually start with A star plus IDA star, because once we understand how that works, then we can actually understand parallel IDA star is actually only a very small change on top of that. Okay. And so the idea here is that when we are running IDA star, IDA star requires almost no memory at all. It only goes down one branch. And so, you know, this is really good because as an algorithm, if you think about a CPU and the CPU caches, we can actually run basically all on the, almost all in registers. Uh, with a good implementation, you can run extraordinarily quickly. And so that's gonna be very powerful to be able to do that for IDA Storm. But we do have really, really large memories, practically speaking, compared to like the amount of memory that IDA Storm requires. And so there's this question of how can I actually run IDA star more efficiently? Uh, how, can I, how can I enhance it? And there's two ways we can enhance it. One, we can build better heuristics, and we'll talk about that later in the class. But right now, we're going to look at what we can do algorithmically to improve things. The other thing we can realize is that thinking about a, a CPU is that CPU raw speeds have topped out. In the early 2000s, we hit CPU speeds between 2 and 3 gigahertz. And they basically stayed at that till today. I mean, we can go up to four gigahertz, and but we're not seeing the same exponential growth that we had previously in the speed of our computers. And so given that, what's happening? Well, our computers are actually getting more cores on them. And so if we want to have search algorithms that work effectively, we're going to have to have them be able to take advantage of the more cores that we have. So that's something that's really useful to pay attention to here. Um, but what A star plus IDA star does is it actually looks and says, you know, there's another issue that's going on. The IDA star, as we said in the previous lecture or in the previous video, IDA star will turn, can turn a very, very small graph into an exponentially growing tree when there are duplicates. And in the last lecture, we also looked at, uh, that we showed an example where we could see in a real world problem that we do get those duplicates. And so what we're going to do in IDA star plus A star is we're going to try to say, let's use a little bit more memory to try to, in practice, we're going to try and get rid of the duplicates that we would see in the normal IDA star tree. And uh, so how does that kind of work? So the idea here is we're going to just simply, we have a start state, and we're going to run an A star search around the start state. Okay, that A star search is the best first search, maintains an open list, and we're gonna take nodes in order from low to high F cost. And we're gonna assume that the heuristic is consistent. So as I search out inside this search, which we don't really normally think about it explicitly with an A star, but we will have iterations of different F costs. And for simplicity, I mean, I'm just gonna put some numbers here. So we could assume I do like 10 and then I do 12 and then I do 14. And then suppose at that point I say, you know, I finished all the nodes with F cost of 14. And so now maybe I've hit my memory limit or I'm very close to my memory limit. And so now I've got a bunch of nodes here. And what I can do is, um, is essentially I can say, well, those are the first couple layers of the IDA star search. And I'm just gonna store them as a single graph in memory. And then I'm gonna run IDA star from that point forward. And so you could imagine here, I've got a bunch of nodes that are on my frontier. And these are all nodes that um, are of F cost, in this case would be of F cost of 14. And from them, then I can continue to search like I would an IDA star search. And um, so I can just imagine doing basically IDA star trees underneath each of these nodes. Okay. And um, so what happens, the amount of memory, well, so I, you know, I've, I've got my A star memory, which is running, it's just sort of running in the core here. And then I've just got my big trees right here. So the, from the perspective of these trees, these trees, we don't really care if they were, you know, IDA star from the beginning or IDA star up to that point. 
the savings that we get in this approach is, and I'll draw this in red here, but you can imagine that we have multiple paths through the state space that could take us to the same frontier node. And so typically with IDA star, we wouldn't notice this and we would end up expanding this entire tree twice. And when I expand this entire tree twice, of course, I pay twice the cost. And so that can be very expensive, especially if this tree gets large. But if I discover that duplicate by keeping it in memory, then I'm only going to expand it once instead of twice. And what we might actually notice is that, you know, there could be many, there could be more than two paths that are actually getting to any frontier node here. And the other thing we might notice is that it's the duplicates that we get very high up in the tree that are very expensive. So very high in the tree, if I find two paths to a single state here, uh, of course, they don't have to be the same cost. One might be more expensive and then it would be a smaller tree underneath it, right? If, if we did actually find a longer path, uh, we would do this. But the point is, is that the shallower that we find a duplicate or that we remove a duplicate, the larger the tree is going to be underneath that. And so that's going to be the larger the savings we get. So we don't necessarily have to have the entire tree in memory to actually get sort of maximize the savings we get from finding duplicates that exist within the tree. And so ID star plus A star is just, um, you know, run. As I said, again, we're going to run a search until we're going to get some frontier here. Now, if all the nodes don't have the same F cost, actually, that's fine. We're just going to continue from the F cost that we have there. And then we're going to do exactly ID A star, but just starting from these frontier nodes. Now, it would seem like this is a fairly obvious idea. And if you look at the literature around this, so this was uh, most was recently published by um, by Boo and Korf. And if you look at the literature around this, what they pointed out is that many people said, well, this is just IDA star plus a transposition table. But there were a few issues here that actually kept it from being exactly that. So there's some important things. For instance, I could keep a transposition table here where I sort of keep track of every state that I've seen inside here, but I could still do an IDA star search through that space. And that actually, there's a lot of work here we could be duplicating or we could be keeping track of, and so there's a lot of overhead there, versus actually maintaining the open list and searching directly from the open list. And so um, whether this is a good approach or not really depends on these sort of very low level questions of how do you do your implementation? So I, a transposition table really could be uh, seen as almost identical to this, but as I said, when I have multiple paths maybe of different costs, then this is gonna just avoid having to think about regenerating those costs. And of course, depending on the size of this search, there could be significant savings and not having to generate these, regenerate these nodes all the time. And so, um, so this is a very simple idea and it's been looked at in many forms across the years. But as I said, there's this recent paper that looks at it again and shows it in practice, especially with a good implementation and thinking about some of these technical details about how you keep the tree in memory, how you avoid doing duplicates, that we can make this to be a very efficient algorithm. Okay, and so um, and and so we get some savings uh, in the paper. They showed like a five times uh, speed up over a regular IDA star algorithm, and so uh, that's a really nice performance increase that we can get there. And it just comes and and the what they showed is that actually in in the sliding tile puzzle where there are many many duplicate paths, then. Uh, then, then we get a large savings in a domain like the Rubik's Cube where there aren't duplicate paths, then there's almost no savings at all, and it's actually not worthwhile to do this. And as I said, we'll look at how we can remove the duplicate paths from the Rubik's Cube in a later lecture. Okay, But this is a, is a, a fairly straightforward idea. As I said, if we have an implementation of both algorithms, we run I, A star, we get to the open list at some point, and then we're going to now do ID A star iterations on top of that. And that's going to lead us to, um, that's going to lead us actually to our parallel version of IDA star. And let's um, actually let's use a different color here. Actually, we can highlight this. What we notice here is that once I know the F cost that I want to search, so I've, let's say I'm doing F cost of 20 or something like that, you know, I've gone out, my green nodes in the open list are F cost of 14. Then what we see is actually that each of these trees here are entirely independent. There's no communication between them. The only thing that comes back from each of these searches is what the next possible F cost could be. But that's a single number. And so it's very easy to aggregate. We just really want to take the min 
of all of those. So that's something that's very easy to do. It doesn't require a lot of data, but these pieces here are entirely independent from each other. And so what you see in IDA star plus A star, this idea of A star plus some search on top of it, we can also apply to a parallel search. Now we may not necessarily want to exceed memory. We really want to do A star out until we get a large enough frontier that we're going to divide the work between threads into a significant number of, of different pieces of work. So we can think of each of these nodes here that's on the open list as one piece of work. And we can write something like a shared queue where we just simply submit all these nodes on the open list, we put them into a queue, and then we have parallel threads that take a node off the open list, uh, take a node off of that queue with a depth limit to search or a cost limit to search, and then each node will search in parallel one of these branches, one of these branches, and, and return back to the main thread the minimum F cost that was seen as part of that search. Okay, so this is a very, very simple implementation of parallel search, and it ends up that, um, because these pieces are very, very, the work is very independent, then the efficiency that you get here in a search is, is very high. Okay, so if we understand this, you know, A star plus IDA star, we could say, yeah, I can run IDA star, but the IDA stars are independent, so I can actually run them in parallel. And so this is, there's an older version of, of an algorithm called parallel IDA star, which essentially does this, but doesn't necessarily frame it exactly in the same language. But I want to show just one other thing here, and then we'll wrap this up, is this question of um, could we do parallelism another way? So we might think about maybe I just want to have each iteration of IDA star be in a separate search. So you can imagine if my F costs are like eight. So I'll go back to here. So for instance, I have F equals eight, and then I have F equals 10. So I can imagine, you know, I've, I've got that iteration, I've got the next iteration, then I might have f equals 12, and I could think about that iteration of states, f is equal to 14, I could have another iteration of states associated with that. So you could imagine that also something that would be efficient might be that maybe I'll just run each of my f costs in parallel. And the question we should ask to check this out is, well, is this going to be efficient? And there's a couple issues with this approach, which is why, why it wouldn't work. So one reason is that the F cost that we use in a later iteration is actually dependent on the search at the previous iteration. So there are some problems where we know, hey, if my last F cost was 10, my next F cost is gonna be 12, but that's not the case in every single domain. And so if that is the case, then we would be able to predict what the next F cost would be, and then we could try to run them in parallel. But the bigger problem is actually what's going on here. If we think about the number of nodes so if we think about my solution being at some particular F cost, um, we already know actually when we think about one plus B plus B squared plus all the way to B to the D, that the time that's spent in these previous iterations is asymptotically it, um, is going to be less than or equal to than the amount of time spent in this final iteration. And what that means is if I put one thread on this final iteration of B to the D, then that thread is actually going to, um, it's going to take this thread as long to run as it takes all the previous iterations to run. And so even if I make these previous iterations be a thousand times faster, the time is still actually going to be dominated by this last layer. Okay. Um, there's an, another consideration that we get here is when we start to run later layers. So I would actually be starting another thread when I finish the previous layers at b to the d plus one. What could actually happen is I could find a solution here. And if I did find a solution at this layer, either that solution could be suboptimal. And so that might not be a good thing. I might have to then keep running. Um, or it is possible that you could be running at B to the D plus one. You could actually find a solution uh, with depth D. And then you'd actually be able to say, oh wait, we can cut off these larger searches. But ultimately what's going to happen is actually we're gonna spend most of our time sitting at this, at this largest level right here, searching that tree. And so, uh, so the parallel savings we get there are minimal. Whereas if we divide the work up as we do here by thinking about these nodes, then we're gonna be much more efficient, okay? So this just shows us two possible ways that we can take IDA star. We can do some search outward, uh, or sorry, do an A star search outward, and then we can do IDA star in parallel, or we can run it sequentially, but basically we can avoid the duplicates that we had there. And so these are both nice enhancements on top of IDA star. 
And next time we'll be looking at what happens when the tree doesn't actually grow exponentially.